Okay, so he would jump into hyperspace for his last talk. Well, I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to be put to shame, so I'm going to go into the fourth dimension, which is time. So I've been talking about what's going on in space for the most part. I've been talking about how you can use spin networks for a quantum description of the geometry of space. But now I'd like to change gears quite a bit and talk about how we could try to extend this formalism to talk about the geometry of space-time. And that is what I call spin bones. So the idea of spin networks, to remind you, is that we have this great complicated graph Edges are labeled with representation, say of SU2 if you're just doing gravity, or some more complicated group if you're trying to include other forces. And vertices labeled with intertwining operators. And you should imagine this graph as being incredibly tiny and filling up all of space. And the edges of it are going to contribute areas to surfaces that they poke through. And I didn't describe this in detail, but the vertices are going to contribute volume to regions that they sit in similar sort of formula. So you see there's a Poincaré duality type thing going on there. And that also, by the way, explains the fact why in this formalism, there's no really good operator, no simple operator describing the length, which is sort of amusing, of course, because of constant general relativity. The metric can be seen as being all about length. But part of why it's happening this way is because here we're working in a formalism where the metric isn't the basic field. It's this connection. It's just a point I forgot to make. Anyway, we have this formalism here, but how can we use it to study space-time? Isn't that really the reason? I mean, it's because you decided to only work with graphs. You could have worked with two, two complexes. If I was smart enough to figure out how yeah. to work with two complexes, that right. would be different. Yeah, right. Um, so, one approach to studying what's going on in space-time is to really understand this Hamiltonian constraint that I keep telling you about. That's probably the solution to the Hamiltonian constraint. Well, that's tough, as I've described. And it's also tough even to know what you do after you've uh, done that, because of the problem of time, as I've described. The Hamil when you impose the Hamiltonian constraint, you're also simultaneously modding out by all the amorphisms of space-time. So understanding time has always been a bit difficult in this canonical or Hamiltonian approach to quantum gravity that I've been talking about. And that's one reason why it's good to try to supplement it with a different approach, which is more along the path integral or Lagrangian lines. The Hamiltonian approach, you see or not, up on this physics jargon, is where you study a physical system by studying up what's going on at a given time. Emphasize that. Whereas the path integral or Lagrangian approach, you're studying things in space time right from the very start. So how can we do such a thing? for the spin network formalism. Well, when I started out thinking about this, I had some naive ideas that I think would occur to anybody who tried to think about this. You can imagine that if we're describing the geometry of space at a given time by a spin network, a graph, and space is just a slice of a four-dimensional space-time manifold, that maybe in space-time, we should have some kind of two-dimensional thing whose slices are these spin networks. And that's the rough idea, very rough idea of a spin foam. So there are different ways of thinking about it. One is to think of a spin foam as some sort of two-dimensional complex, this wise linear complex, going from a spin network to another spin network, describing how a spin network changed. So you may have noticed that Dylan Thurston's talk was really all about these sort of pictures, and that's no coincidence. Really the same math going on. Another way to think about it, this is related, is to think that a spin foam should be such a thing that if you took a slice of it generically, you'd get a spin. So the name spin foam is, I hope, self evident here. Um, they look a lot like soap suds. So the idea should be that the faces of the spin foam, the two dimensional cells, when you slice them, they'll give you the spin network edges. The spin bone edges, when you slice them, will be giving you the spin network vertices. 
The spin foam will also have vertices like this, like this vertex right here. And those will be describing when something interesting happens, that is, when the topology of your spin network changes, as you imagine moving time down the page. So those would be what we call interactions in physics. Um, uh, I'll say a couple more words about why spin bolts is a nice word for this. Two of the great visionaries in quantum gravity were Penrose and Wheeler. Penrose invented spin networks. Wheeler had this notion that if you examine it at a very short distance scale, space-time would not at all look like the, a Lorentzian manifold. It would have a very drastically different structure. He wasn't sure what that structure was, so he called it space-time foam. He thought it would be some very chaotic, boiling, bubbly sort of structure. And so, combining their ideas, the term spin foam is very natural, and it's even more amusing that these are work exactly like soap suds. Of course, you have to make that a bit more precise. It's easiest to define closed spin foams and also closed spin networks. That's what I've been talking about. Yeah. This is an irritating little problem here. Yeah, so all I've ever been talking about so far, well, then I can't see the bottom. It's sort of, that's what's irritating about it. Well, it's easy to fix one end. So, um, so all I've been talking about so far is closed spin networks. I'll tell you what open ones are in a second. So just to remind you, they're, they, they're a triple consisting of a graph whose edges are labeled by unitary, and I usually use irreducible representations of our, of our group, G, some compact complete group, say. Uh, vertices labeled by intertwining operators from the tensor product of the reps of the incoming edges to the tensor product of the reps labeled the outgoing edges. Well, we can just copy that sort of definition, if we like, to come up with a tentative definition of a closed spin foam, just knock the dimensions up one. So a closed spin foam will be an oriented, two-dimensional, piecewise linear CW complex. So that's a mouthful. A piecewise linear CW complex, you can roughly imagine it's just a bunch of polygons stuck together along their edges. Maybe with some free edges, but vertices floating around. I'm not so interested in those. That's a 2D PLCW complex. By orientation, I mean something very weak. I just mean that each two dimensional face has an orientation and each edge has an orientation, but no compatibility between them. Just sort of a bookkeeping device. And then once we have such a thing, we can copy this sort of definition here. We just say a spin foam will be such a thing with faces labeled by representations, unitary or visible representations of our group, and edges labeled by intertwining operators from the tensor product of the representations labeling the incoming faces to the tensor product of the reps labeling the outgoing faces. So here we can define incoming and outgoing using these orientations. We say a face is incoming to it an edge if the orientations match in this way here, and outgoing if they don't match. So the nice thing about this is that if you imagine a closed fit foam, and you imagine generically slicing it, you'll get a closed fit network. Now it's nice to also think about open ones. I know what you're saying, the vertices. Not, we don't label the vertices with anything of the same sort. Well, I'll talk about the vertices. Those are the interactions where things, well, they're, they're a little different. So we could, I'm not going to try to give formal definitions, but just to give you the idea, because I think it's illuminating, I'll mention the open spin networks and spin foams. So the idea of an open spin network is that it's a spin network but where we allow some loose edges coming in and going out. That's what uh, Misha was calling external legs or univalent vertices, but I prefer not to think of them as vertices. Um, so these open spin networks are pretty obviously going to be the morphisms of a category. If I have such a spin network, I have another one whose domain matches the codomain of this one. I can stick one on the other and pose them. And those are, of course, very famous gadgets. They're also in a specific case called Feynman diagrams. 
So I should emphasize, which I haven't done so far, that if you take your group G to do this non-compact group, the punk array group, uh, I don't know what that little blob is, I, I mean semi-direct product, or well, direct product group, uh, I guess that word is because of times there. So if G is the punk array group times some compact B group, that's the sort of symmetry group that particle physicists like, then these open spin networks are nothing other than the find the diagrams that you see in particle physics. Uh, and the di I should just point out that the, the divergences in evaluating Feynman diagrams, which have plagued the subject ever since the beginning, are just due to the fact that the irreducible unitary representations of this sort of thing are <coughs> infinite dimensional, and so various sums diverge, which are finite in the compact case. So part of what we're doing, you see, when we're going to spin networks with SU2 gauge group and using them to study general relativity. So we're shifting our attention away from the Poincaré group, which includes the translation boosts, over to this compact group, and that makes things kind of finer. Um, so similarly, we could define open spin clones, which would be something with a bunch of loose ends and edges going from an open spin network to another open spin network. So these are the type of, well, this, this for example here is a depiction of the uh, 6J symbols as a process, process of going from some spin network like this to some spin network like this. And that process is this open spin phone here. So if we put all this stuff together, what we get is a two category, that is a uh, a gadget that has objects, which are collections of labeled points, uh, morphisms, which are these spin networks, and two morphisms going between morphisms, which are these uh, open spin clones. And part of what I'm trying to do here, although I'm trying to downplay, downplay it, is take the ordinary theory of Feynman diagrams and what I would call categorify it, that is, add an extra level of structure to it, have things going between Feynman diagrams. So implicit in this, there's a whole lot of uh, category, two category theory. But I found that as a sales pitch, it's often good to hide that. So, uh, so what sort of physical theory would you try to build using spin phones? Well, the rough idea is something like this. I'll call it a spin phone model describe it in a very general way, and then I'll talk about a lot of specific examples. So a spin foam model, what its job is, is to assign a complex number called an amplitude to each spin foam. That's supposed to be analogous to all these rules that you've been learning about for Feynman diagrams, how to calculate a number from any Feynman diagram. This is called those numbers amplitudes. If you take the absolute value of the square, it gives you the probability that some process will occur. So we want to be able to calculate the process, sorry, the probability that some process described by a spin foam will occur in this theory. And we do it in a way just mimicking the usual theory of Feynman diagrams, but throwing in an extra dimension. So we will get this number z of f as a product of, of numbers calculated, first of all, from the faces and edges, which are labeled in a certain way. Those numbers go by the name of propagators, just as in ordinary Feynman diagrams, the numbers you calculate for edges are called propagators. And then finally, the sort of really needy part is the numbers we calculate for vertices. The vertices of a spin foam are labeled, but their incident faces and edges are. We use those incident labelings to calculate a number, and that we call the amplitude for a certain interaction to occur, a certain process of for example, something vertex occurring in the spin foam that goes from here to here, and that vertex amplitude will tell us the probability, ultimately, for this spin network to turn into this spin network after a while. So the model will give you actual information that refers to the previous definition. Right, the model is where I stick in stuff at the vertices, not in the definition of the spin foam. You could organize it in slightly different ways, but that's the way so as I said, this is all exactly modeled after the theory of Feynman diagrams, just pushed up a notch. Um, 
Now, there are lots of ways you can try to study spin foams, and people are just beginning to start studying them. They've been working on them, I guess, for about, uh, well, explicitly working on them for about five years now, although they've actually been secretly working on them before that. And you can try to study them embedded in a manifold. You can try to study them embedded in a real analytic manifold to make the maximum amount of contact with the stuff I've been talking about in my previous talks. You could go wild and consider them not embedded in any manifold at all. So there are a lot of people working in quantum gravity whose dream is that ultimately we're going to throw out the whole notion of a manifold representing space-time and just think of space-time as just being like an elaborate Feynman diagram or your elaborate spin phone. So space-time just is the process occurring, not occurring in anything. That I ultimately favor. But I will present here a sort of halfway house that has a bit of the combinatorial flavor of the second group, but a little bit of the algebra, uh, topological flavor of the first group, and that's to consider them sitting in a manifold with a fixed <coughs> triangulation. So if we take a space-time manifold and triangulate it, it turns out to be nice to consider spin foams, which are living in the two skeleton of the dual complex. So here I've if space-time were three-dimensional, we'd chop it up to tetrahedra, and the dual complex would have one vertex sitting inside each tetrahedra. And those would be our spin foam vertices, where something happens. And then we'd have these spin foam faces, one intersecting each edge of our triangle. Those are these, I've shown part of those as these little parallelograms here. And then finally, we have these spin foam edges, one hooking through each triangle in our triangulation. So that's the concrete duality game. And we hope to imagine this and actually in four dimensional quantum gravity. Right? Well, yeah. So if we're, if, when you want to do four dimensional quantum gravity, you should try to, I'll show you some pictures. So you have to try to imagine this in a four manifold. It actually turns out that a lot of work on spin foam models has been carried out most successfully for three dimensional quantum gravity. So I will also be talking about, about this actual picture here. So now what I'm going to do, after this rough sketch of the, of the program, is to describe a bunch of spin foam models and just quickly tell you what sort of results have been gotten for all of these different models. So I'm going to become a lot more impressionistic and rapid than, than I have been in previous talks. Um, oh, but before I jump into specific models, I should say a little bit more about how you would try to physics with this kind of approach. Uh, so here, in this particular setting, we're going to we need to talk about space and space-time. So let's take an n minus one dimensional manifold S representing space equipped with a fixed triangulation. And then we want to associate a Hilbert space to that, which would be the space of states, the ways the world could be if space was, were that manifold. That Hilbert space, or more precisely the kinematical Hilbert space, Z of S, will just be this kind of Hilbert space I talked about before, L2 of A sub gamma mod G sub gamma. This is the space of connections mod gauge transformations on a graph. Which graph? Well, just the dual one skeleton to the triangulation of our manifold. So here I'm drawing a picture for two plus, where, where space is two dimensional. I've triangulated this two manifold and this dark dark lines would be the spin network edges. And this is the sort of picture that shows up in spin foam models at 2 plus 1. When I say 2 plus 1, that means 2 space, 1 time. So this is the sort of picture that shows up in 2 plus 1 dimensional quantum gravity all the time in this approach. So okay, that's how we get Hilbert spaces, and that connects back to the old stuff we've been talking about. But now, what about space time? Well, there we represent space-time as a chordism going from one choice of space to another, we're going to put that with the triangulation too, that's compatible with the triangulations of S and S prime, and we want to get an operator, Z of M, going from this Hilbert space Z of S to that Hilbert space Z of S prime. That operator is supposed to tell us how a state will evolve in time to a new state. And the way we define this operator is we define it by means of uh, sandwiching it inside with, with in your inner products with two vectors, psi and psi prime, 
here I'm going to take these vectors of psi, psi prime to actually be spin networks, which form a basis, remember, of these two Hilbert spaces. So if I know all these inner products, I know Z of M. Uh, how do I calculate this? Well, it's easy. I just sum over all spin phones going from, these are open spin phones, going from the initial spin network to the final spin network. And what I sum are these amplitudes here. So this is, again, completely modeled after the usual theory of Feynman diagrams, but with all the dimensions knocked up a notch. That is, in ordinary Feynman diagrammatics, if you're trying to calculate the amplitude that, say, a, a, the two electrons starting out here will, at the end of the day, be in two other positions, we need to sum or integrate over all Feynman diagrams connecting them. For example, one option is that, is that they could exchange a photon and bounce off each other like this. This would be a simple term. For the Feynman rules tell you the amplitude that you're supposed to calculate for each Feynman diagram. Then you sum or integrate over all those Feynman diagrams to calculate the amplitude of going from this state to this state. If you have amp amplitude, you get that to the value squared. And that's the probability. So these are what this is called transition amplitudes. And this is the, the sort of obvious rule for trying to calculate them from in a spin flow model. Now, in some kinds of spin flow models, well, in some kind of spin bow models, this result will, first of all, first, so first of all, you always have to worry about convergence issues, or at least you have to decide not to worry about them. But you have to, this is an infinite sum here, so you have to ponder the question of whether this really converges or not. If it doesn't, well, then you sort of wave your hands and hope you can somehow get something interesting out anyway. If it does, you're happy, and you're even doubly happy, at least as a mathematician, if the result turns out to be independent of the triangulation of M, at least away from its boundary. If you have triangulation independence, then you can usually manage to uh, turn this, this functor Z into a topological quantum field theory. So a lot of topological quantum field theories are constructed this way. I don't expect that the physically realistic theories will be triangulation independent in that way. But let me go through some spin foam models of this sort. So the very first one goes back to about 1968, the work of the physicists Ponzano and Regge. And they didn't think about it as a spin foam model, of course. But this turns out to be a theory of what I would call Riemannian quantum gravity in three-dimensional space-time. That is, you take general relativity not as a theory of Lorentzian metrics, which is what it really should be, but as a theory of Riemannian metrics, and you quantize it, and just for fun, you make the dimension of space-time be three instead of four, which is it really should be, and you get a theory that's much simpler than full-fledged quantum gravity. The group here, you could take it to be SO3, that's sort of the most obvious natural group to use if you're doing three-dimensional Riemannian geometry, but it's not bad to work with a double cover SU2, and that's what I'll I'll do, since I've been talking a lot about SU2. So in this particular case, the spin foams you've got will be dual to the triangulation of a three manifold. So the spin foam vertices will all look like this one here. This is just a blow up of this picture I had drawn earlier. This is just, so this, this little picture, this, this here is a, the dual two skeleton of a triangulated three manifold, but if we examine what that singularity there in the middle looks like, it looks like this. Or some rotated version of this. So to specify the spin foam model, after I tell you what the group is, I've got to tell you the vertex amplitudes, the edge amplitudes, and the face amplitudes. And the beautiful thing is they're all the simplest possible thing you can imagine. So Notice here, the faces of the spin foam are labeled with spins, these numbers J1 through J6. And if I go to the vertex and imagine drawing a little two-sphere around it, and take the intersection of the spin foam with that two-sphere, the picture I get will just be this tetrahedron here, 
which will inherit labelings of its edges from the labelings of the faces. Exactly the matter shown. So for example, this face here gives you this edge labeled with J1. So we are going to calculate the spin foam vertex amplitude using this little picture here. That's the data at this uh, its incident to this vertex. And the way we do it is the most obvious thing in the world. Well, it's at least the most obvious thing in the world if you're used to this diagrammatic uh, business. So I'm sure a lot of you are very familiar with this. So this thing here is a spin network. How can you get a number out of a spin network? Well, there are a lot of different ways, but one way is to think of this as a function on the space of connections, as I've described, and evaluate it on the flat connection. That gives you a number. So that's one way to think about how you're getting this number. Another way to think about it is purely algebraic. If I have a bunch of, if I have a graph with edges labeled by representations and vertices labeled by intertwiners, I can read it from top to bottom on the page as composing a bunch of operators and possibly tensoring them if I sit two of them side by side. And if that graph is closed, that is, if there's nothing coming in at the top and nothing going out at the bottom, the result will be an operator from the complex numbers to the complex numbers, which is essentially just a number, a complex number. So that's another way to calculate a number from a spin network, and that agrees with the way that I just described in terms of evaluating it on the flat connection. Just the same thing relates to the same thing. So anyway, people who work on these kind of uh, things have been using this technology for ages by now. And so you get a number out of these six spins. The modern name for that is the tetrahedral net, or tet net. It's a close relative of the six J symbols that I talked about earlier. Okay, and you do the same thing to calculate the edge amplitudes and the face amplitudes. The edge amplitudes you intersect the two sphere with a with a with a bit of this, this edge here, and you get this theta graph, theta net. The edge amplitude actually turns out to be the reciprocal of that. The face amplitude is the value of this loop, which is really just the Essentially, the dimension of this representation is actually plus or minus the dimension of the forward and really not great categories of super dimension, if you like, of this representation. So notice what's going on here. We have this times the reciprocal. We've got a factor of this for each vertex times the factor of the reciprocal of this for each edge times the factor of this for each face. So that alternating pattern of things and the reciprocals, you've already seen in the Feynman diagram case, where he, he had this, where Misho, when he was describing Feynman diagrams, he had a reciprocal of something for each edge and a something for each uh, vertex. So this is a continuation of that pattern. So this is their model of three-dimensional uh, Riemannian quantum gravity, and they derived it in a nice heuristic way from other considerations, which I won't have time to explain. But there's a big problem with it. When you try to sum over all spin foams, sum the amplitudes that you calculate this way over all spin foams, it diverges. You're summing over infinitely many spins here, so you have to be a little lucky for it to converge, and it doesn't. You don't have that luck. It diverges. In physics jargon, what we've got here is what we call an infrared divergence. This divergence is coming from the fact that these spins can be arbitrarily large. What does large spin mean? Well, physically, it means that the, the geometry that the spin foam is describing is very large. That is, we're describing very, they're corresponding to large free manifolds. So that, in a sense, this is a discretized analog of integrating over all the Riemannian metrics on a free manifold, and we're getting a divergence because there are very big metrics. So this is the opposite of the ultraviolet divergences which plague normal quantum field theory. The normal problem in quantum field theory, I mean the worst problem in normal quantum field theory are divergences when things are, when you're looking at things that are very small, short scale divergences. Those are the kinds of their primer was, was discussing. But here, it's the so red divergence. So you're quantum far more than <laughs> right, yeah, I didn't want to show off that much, but yeah, but so what's nice, what makes people happy about this, at least this 
particular type of model is that traditional approaches to quantum gravity were completely killed by the ultraviolet divergences. Which, but here, since space time is not really being uh, continual in the same way that it was, you might hope that they would be cured, and they are cured. But you still have these infrared levels. If you made your manifold, you me, or if you put a limitation on the jade, you the manifold was intact. Well, that, that wouldn't make a limitation on the J's, but you could just say, hey, I'm not interested in worrying about experiments where the size of the experiment is arbitrarily large. I'm only interested in answering questions about what's going on in this room. You could then, by means of asking that sort of question, you can incorporate a limitation on how big the geometries you are considering, and then You've got to extract the finite answer out of this sort of theory. That's why physicists regard infrared divergences as much less fatal than ultraviolet ones. And so they know there's sort of ways to get around the uh, infrared ones just by because you're studying things within a bounded region of space or space time. Now, but because of those divergences and other things, people didn't really go much with, go very far with that Manzano Rezzi model. And so much later, when Sarai and Vero, or sometime around 1992, realized that you could cure those <coughs> divergences in the Manzano Rezzi model by replacing the group as by the corresponding quantum group, where you take the parameter in your quantum group, this Q that always shows up in your quantum group, the neo suitable root of unity. And then the great thing about quantum groups is that they act very much like the groups, but if you fix Q to be the right sort of root of unity, there are some conditions that need to hold. There are only finitely many nice irreducible representations. There are actually lots of irreducible representations, but if you can pick out a, a finite collection of them and define a tensor product on them so that the tensor product of two of those will just be a sum of other ones of that sort. You so still have the triangle equality and why you have to Yes, all sorts of things like that still hold. That's right. So basically, I mean, the first approximation of what happens, there's more to it than this, but the first approximation of what happens is that instead of needing to sum over all spins, all of all half integers, you sum up over all spins up to a certain point and stop there. And that makes the sum converge. And Turai and Piro were able to show that in this case, you actually get a triangulation independent result when you get a topological quantum field theory on it. So the question is, from a physics point of view, what is this parameter Q? Where did it come from, and how come it's somehow saving the day? Well, it turns out, further investigations reveal that it corresponds to modifying the classical equations to incorporate an extra term called the cosmological constant term, which is one option you always have in general relativity, which Einstein discovered. And this extra term, what it does is it means that even the vacuum has some energy density, and it means that instead of, well, without the cosmological constant term, Einstein's equations in three space-time dimensions say the metric is flat, very different than in four dimensions. But with this cosmological constant term, it says that the metric has constant curvature, depending on what this constant is. And if you pick the sign of this lambda correctly, it will be positively curved, and so you're, you're you're going to be dealing with a, with a integrating over manifolds of a certain, three manifolds of a certain positive curvature, and that means that they can't be too big. So the infrared divergences go away. That's a heuristic explanation of, of why this uh, magic happens here. So there's a complicated relationship between the cosmological constant, this turn sinus level k that Misha was talking about, and q that shows up in the quantum group. And the nice thing is, this was later on generalized to all sorts of other quantum groups. You can get lots of PQFTs that way. Okay, but well, what about four dimensions? Well, in 1992, also, Aguri described a four dimensional theory, which we now can think of as a spin flow model, where the gauge group G is also SU2. Now we're in four dimensions. So to describe this model, I need to, again, give vertex edge and face amplitudes, but now 
your spin foam will be in the dual two skeleton of a triangulated four-mount bowl. It's a little bit harder to visualize triangulated four-mount folds, but, but it's not all that hard. So down here, notice we have a four-bailing vertex. That's a little piece of a spin network sitting inside a three mount pole. Up here then we have this other corvalent graph. And the spin foam is the process of going from one to the other by basically the birth of this little tetrahedron. So this is a this is this here is what you would see right in the middle of a four simplex. And if you do the same trick, intersect, well intersect that now with a three sphere put a little three sphere around that vertex, you will again get a graph as the intersection. And now this time the graph will be this complete uh, graph on five vertices. And again, sorry? One skeleton. Yeah, it's the one skeleton of a four simplex, which is dual to the four simplex that you're, that this whole picture is sitting inside. And you'll notice that, by the way, the way things work, the edges will be labeled by spins, just because the faces have been labeled by spins over here. And the right and, uh, vertices here will be labeled by intertwiners, because the edges here will be labeled by intertwiners, although I didn't write that. And so you get this thing, a spin network, which depends on 15 spins, actually, 10 for labeling the edges, 5 for labeling these intertwiners here. Spins subscribe those, as I've described. So this is a spin network. We can evaluate it using the same technology that I described in the 3D case, and you get a number. That's just vertex amplitude. Then it goes the same way. You take the reciprocal of this graph here to be the edge amplitude. You take this loop here, again, to be your face amplitude. And you get an interesting theory. It's interesting because heuristically, you can argue that it corresponds to the, the classical theory with this Lagrange. Here, f is the curvature of an SU2 connection. E is a two-form taking values in, say, the Lie algebra of SU2, or globally speaking, add P, where P is your principal level. This kind of theory goes by the name of EF theory, or EF theory. And it's a nice sort of a simple gauge theory. Um, so I'm not at all explaining how you get from here to here. That's a big, long story. But one can do it with about the same level of rigor as, as Michel was getting from Lagrange to these Feynman rules in the simpler situations. And again, however, this theory is bad in the sense that you get divergences. When you try to sum over all the spins, you get a divergent sum. But again, it can be cured by the introduction of quantum groups. So at about the same time, Crane and Yetter modified the Aguri model by replacing S2 by a quantum group. Taraya, in his theory of shadows, was working not with the triangulation, the way Crane and Yetter worked, but directly with what I call the spin foam, this dual two skeleton. And so they both had more rules for calculating numbers for four manifolds, which are essentially equivalent, and they simply amount to taking that previous transparency, and wherever you see any throughout SU2, you replace that by the quantum group. And so you get a finite a convergent sum, and it turns out to be triangulation independent, and so you get a four-dimensional QFT this way. And we believe that this process of replacing the group by the quantum group corresponds, again, to adding an extra term to the action of your theory, a cosmological constant type term. Uh, I wrote a paper trying to argue for that. Ever since then, people have cited that paper as proof that this is true, but I don't really believe it. I mean, I was trying to argue that it was true, but I think there really needs to be a lot more work to make a direct connection between this and this. And you can replace the group by a quantum, sorry, you can work with any other quantum group in this setup too. So there are those triangulation independent 
spin full models of three and four dimensions. Just a very quick remark. Uh -huh. I was speaking to Jim Simon yesterday, and I said, I'm going to call the X-Bar, and Jim Simon was the uh -huh. He said his original motivation for writing the Jim Simon was the variant was to find the combinatorial formula the signature of the formula. This last theory of the board precisely does the output of this last theory is the combinatorial formula. So his dream was realized. Yes. You might ask what four manifold invariant is computed by this TGFD. It's basically the exponential of some linear combination of a signature and a Euler class. The signature, of course, is the interesting part. So the part nobody had a combinatorial problem. Oh, it had a perfectly beautiful combinatorial form that is the only really one that satisfies the criteria of being a combinatorial form. Okay. Well, there, yeah, there's sort of an argument about, about that, I guess, but I don't know as well as you. Now, well, what about four-dimensional quantum gravity, an actual theory of gravity? So these theories I've been talking about, gravity in three dimensions, and some simplified brother of gravity in four dimensions, aren't gravity in four dimensions yet. Well, Barrett and Crane tried to construct a spin foam model for four-dimensional quantum gravity. In 1997, they did, they cooked up such a model but still not the final thing because it was a model of Riemannian quantum gravity, that is, of Riemannian rather than Lorentzian metrics on a four manifold. And so the gauge group that they used was the double cover of the rotation group in four dimensions. That's basically a nice part of the SCT processor, too. And the idea of it, which I'm just quickly sketching here, is that you can write down the action for four-dimensional general relativity by taking this action I've shown you before, the action for this EF theory, and posing extra constraints on the big E field to say that it's of the form little e wedge little e, where little e here is a uh, one form taking values in some vector bundle that's equipped with a money metric four-dimensional vector bundle, the Riemannian metric, it's isomorphic to the tangent bundle, but it's good to think of it as a separate thing. So then, if you take two copies of these E fields and wedge them together, both wedging the one-form part and also this tau value part, you get a two-form, the values of the second exterior power of tau, which you can think of as the same sort of thing that this E field here is. So, well, I'm, as you see, I'm Zip along here, but there's a approach. There are lots and lots of ways to rewrite the action for general relativity. This is one, right? It is a constrained EF theory. And so that's nice because if you know how to make a spin foam model for the EF theory, you can try to pose those constraints in the spin foam model somehow and get a spin foam model for general relativity. So that's what they did. And what that constraint amounts to is a constraint on which representations and which intertwining operators you label your spin foam with that somehow mimic after this. And if you do that, you get a spin foam model. And, well, there's some questions about the normalizations. There's some questions and arguments about what the correct base and edge amplitudes are. But if you work with a slightly different version than they originally proposed, it turns out that you can show this remarkable fact, Perez showed this remarkable fact, that then the sum over spin foam is actually convergence. So this was shown at the beginning of this, oh, last year, end of last year. So you actually are able to calculate a finite answer from this quantum gravity theory and the problems with it, it means that it's not yet our, the answer to all our hopes and dreams, are first of all, it's a Riemannian quantum gravity, and second of all, it's depending on a fixed triangulation of our four manifold. That may or may not ultimately be a problem, but it's certainly something we have to worry about because no one ever has given any evidence that our world comes with a fixed triangulation. So, so this is still not the, the final answer. And it's probably not the triangulation independent theory. So it's a bit puzzling. Then the final 
step along this road is to try to do the same thing, but for Lorentzian four-dimensional quantum gravity. And Bert Craig came up with a Lorentzian version of the theory in 1999. <coughs> so now we're really working with the double cover of the Lorentz group, SL2C. And now everything gets a lot more tricky. This is a non-compact group. So the irreducible representations will usually be infinite dimensional. You can try to copy everything that was done on the, in the Riemannian case over in this case, but you have now, so you, you have certain irreducible representations of SL2C labeling edges and certain special intertwining operator labeling the vertices. That's what we figured out. But it's not at all obvious that this basic ingredient, the uh, vertex amplitude, is, kind of, is a convergent quantity. However, John Barrett and I later on showed that it does converge. So you can express this kind of thing as an integral, just like an ordinary Feynman diagram, so you can get an integral. Uh, one way to express it is as an integral where all these points roam over three-dimensional hyperbolic space, because that, that's what, this is called the, the mass shell in Minkowski uh, space. That's a space on which this group acts. So you have an integral over a five-fold product of this uh, three-dimensional hyperbolic space. That integral, it does diverge because you can translate all five points, or push all five points around it as isometries and uh, change the integral. So it does diverge. However, you can divide out by the obvious infinity, that is the volume of uh, this hyperbolic space. That just amounts to fixing the location of one of those five points you're integrating over. That's a perfectly fine trick as far as these things go. And then you get an integral, which is still not obviously convergent because it's over this uh, four times three-dimensional uh, non-compact manifold, but we showed it does converge. So that summer, what I did was I showed an integral over 12 variables convergence. And it was a lot of fun because I'd started out as an analyst, and that's the sort of thing that, that we did back then. And then I shifted over into this quantum gravity business and started learning about n categories and quantum groups and all sorts of fancy stuff. But it was nice to know that I could still, with help from John Barrett, a lot of help from John Barrett, I could still show that an integral converge. So, so that proved that the spin foam vertex amplitudes actually made sense. But then there's the next question, which is, does the sum over labelings, in your, does the sum over spin bones converge? And in fact, now it's really an integral over spin bones because the, the things labeling the spin bone faces are these representations of SL2C, but these are representations from some continuous family of representations, not a discrete family the way you get in the compact group. So it turns out that that integral also inverges. That was shown by Lewis Crane, Carlo Clavelli, and Perez, Alejandro Perez, in April of this year. So that means that we're in a similar situation to the Riemannian case now. We have this spin foam model for four-dimensional Lorentzian quantum gravity on a four manifold with a fixed triangulation. You can think of that as an approximation to some ultimate theory that wouldn't depend on a triangulation. You know, actually approximated by a chopping space time up into little pieces and replacing some continuum problem by a discrete one. Uh, other people have different attitudes towards this. They think that perhaps the uh, discrete thing is the ultimate thing. But there's a lot of argument going on there. So this is sort of a quick sketch of, of spin so foam models. Be the of these, uh, almost certainly not. Almost certainly these four-dimensional quantum gravity models are not triangulation independent, do not give to QFT. The big problem is, is we have a conceptual problem in knowing what to do with spin foam model, models that don't give T to QFT. There's no reason in the world why four-dimensional quantum gravity should be a T QFT. So, it's not that we really want it to be TQFT, it's just that we're not quite sure what to do with the triangulation dependence uh, when, when, when we don't have a TQFT. One approach would be to try to take a limit as you refine the triangulation, not sure that these converge in some sense. 
Another approach would be to sum over all possible triangulations, which would be very much in the spirit of summing over all, all uh, Feynman diagrams, but we're not so sure. Right now I'm working with the homotopy theorist Dan Christensen and the science fiction writer Greg Egan to do a bunch of uh, numerical calculations of the partition function, that is the sum over spin bones, in the Riemannian case, not this theory of the one before. And we're discovering a bunch of interesting things. And then we would like to write some programs between the integrals in the, in the uh, Florentian case. Um, so the issue is that even once we know these integrals converge, there's still a lot of work to be done to figure out what they're like, what, what, what do we get out of all this work. And right now, we don't have any beautiful perturbation theory or any approximation techniques to extract useful qualitative information out of uh, formalism, so we're deciding to tackle it the brute force way of just actually trying to put some of these on the computer, and we're learning some interesting things, even though maybe eventually we'll learn that we didn't really need to do that computer stuff if we've been smarter. I think right now this is a very nice uh, situation to begin. You have some theories that give you finite computable answers and be in the position of being able to use a computer to try to see what the theories are like. So I'll stop here. way, the potential product of representations this way, the potential product of representations this way, 
depends on the choice of whether this is an overcrossing or undercrossing. There are two different ways to switch these things. And so the, the, so the fact that those braiding satisfy the Eric Baxter equation is what means that you get a number out of the spin network as soon as you embed it in R3, and that number doesn't change when you apply any isotopes to that. Well, the one skeleton is the portion of the embedded in the three here. Right, yeah. So you use right. that data to make the bad evaluation. That's right, yeah. There's also really a framing yeah. in there. Would it also make, make sense to move away from roots affinity to generic values as a deformation parameter? Well, people who. Some things you can do away from roots of unity, but the reason why people like roots of unity is because then, from among all the irreducible representations of your quantum group, you can pick a finite collection and define a new smaller category in which they're the only irreducible representations, or the only simple objects, and, and work with that. And that lets you make these sums, which have been infinite sums, become finite sums. So basically, Although people should really study to see what you can do away from the roots of unity. Most people are very happy that there are those ones. Yeah? Uh, it's very important for a special uh, model. Uh, I believe Laura Friedel is the, Is there any hope for a three-dimensional model with a non-compact gauge group? So you notice, first I didn't, I, I didn't mention any model of that sort. So certainly we should understand the three-dimensional model with SO21 gauge group. That would be the Lorentzian three-dimensional quantum gravity model. That should be a lot simpler than the four-dimensional one. Uh, and for a while, there's just been a kind of lacuna in work on that subject. But now Laurent, a fellow named Laurent Freidel is working away on that. Also, John Barrett has a student who carefully worked out the representation theory of the cuneiformed SO21. So the here goes dimensional unitary representation of that. So the mathematical technology is there, and we're on final strength to study that. Yeah, that'll be very interesting. I mean, some things about it won't work as well, of course, as the compact ones, because the representations are really, I believe, they're really dimensional. Although I think people are still confused about classifying all the uh, representations of quantum groups where the group in question was not compact. People don't necessarily know what happens at the roots of unity in those cases, but perhaps some of those infinite dimensional representations become finite dimensional right there. That would be interesting. But I, I don't know. Anyway, people are working on that. Okay.